From the home studios of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, this is Teach Lab, a podcast about the art and craft of teaching. I'm Justin Reich. Today, we're happy to welcome Mike Caulfield. Mike's a digital information literacy expert working at Washington State University. He's worked with a wide variety of organizations on digital literacy initiatives to combat misinformation um, with the AASCU's American Democracy Project, the National Writing Project, and Civics Canada. He's a winner of the Rita Allen Misinformation Solutions Prize and the author of the award-winning textbook, Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers. He's an early believer in the idea of civic digital literacies and Mike's award-winning work has been covered by the New York Times, the Chronicle of Higher Education, NPR, and the MIT Technology Review. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, Justin. Um, Mike, we've talked over the years about OER, about open educational resources, about uh, digital information literacy, but I actually don't know the story of how you got interested in this particular topic. Um, where does it begin for you? Yeah, it actually it actually begins, I don't know, it probably might begin before, uh, before we met. Um, uh, I actually... Um, when I used to work at uh, Keene State College in uh, New Hampshire, a public uh, liberal arts college, um, we were looking at uh, digital literacy uh, outcomes, right? We're rolling out a new outcome, right? Testable outcome uh, to be integrated into classes. And so, you know, we, we, you know I led a committee on that. And, um, and we kind of came up with something that if people are familiar with Howard Rheingold's work, uh, something that kind of mirrored some of Howard's work, right? We had uh, participatory technologies, um, collaborative technologies. You know that I'm, I've been big into collaborative technologies, like wikis um, and those like kinds wikis of things. and so forth. Uh, and then we had this one thing called critical consumption, right? And um, it turned out to be the one that uh, a lot of instructors uh, uh, picked to be part of their courses was this critical consumption thing. And um, the thing about uh, university level outcomes is you assess them. <laughs> and uh, so at the end of the semester, uh, people were assessing them. And uh, I, I got this call from the library that said, hey, did you come over here? We got it. I want to show you something. And uh, so I get, I get called in and they said, you know, so we did the assessment. We taught these critical consumption things using this thing called CRAP. And we did the uh, CERAAP. And we did the assessment, and here are some of the things that we found when we actually assessed at the end of the semester, the sources that students were using. Um, and uh, one of the sources was, um, like, it was like a website that was like government slaves, and the student was like, I think, citing them on like water policy or something, you know, it had the whole colloidal silver, you know, sort of advertisements uh, on the side. And so it was really clear that something had gone um, this this is a website uh, which is just like filled with sort of conspiracy <laughs> theory and strangeness. Yeah, you've, exactly. You've had a series of students which have been nominally trained to be able to evaluate these sources, and you're now doing a more formal university wide evaluation. Yeah. And, and as the tests are coming back in from these various classrooms, people are tapping on the shoulder and saying, "Mike, I think something is really, really <laughs> wrong." Here. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, and so, uh, you know, I agreed and, um, uh, uh, you know, and we, we started to look into this and, and what we found at that point, uh, was that what a lot of students were actually missing was not sort of critical thinking skills, right? They were, uh, you know, as we think of critical thinking skills, they're missing some just real basics. Like, what is this site I'm looking at? Like, can I find out, like, is this claim associated, like if I do a web search, is this claim associated with, you know, uh, conspiracy theory or is this sort of a, a consensus reality claim? Um, and, and we tried to advance that as part of something and ask you, uh, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, uh, for a while uh, called the E-Citizenship Project. And we tried to advance this uh, from like 2010 to 20, 2013. Uh, but at that time, there just wasn't a whole lot of interest in this particular issue. And so uh, kind of put that aside. And uh, uh, I think uh, I met you uh, uh, when I was, uh, I kind of put that, as, again, out of lack, not of lack of my interest, but out of lack of the interest of anyone else in this particularly weird issue. Uh, had been work. I, I went and did a bunch of stuff on collaborative tech, you know, and that that's where you get into the wiki. That's where you get into uh, federated wiki. The idea of uh, if you see my stuff about 
you know, we, we, we kind of live in this stream, but we want to get back to this, this uh, web as garden, all this, all this stuff that, uh, I don't know, that kind of theoretical. Um, then, of course, you know, 2016 happens, and a bunch of people that had worked with me before uh, on um, these issues uh, started saying, hey, <laughs> you know, maybe, we should make a, maybe we should make another go at this. And, um, and I agreed, uh, but I, I think something really lucky happened, uh, as I was starting to like, sort of find the old stuff and pull it together. Um, I kind of had this grab bag of tricks that students could do. Here's, you know, here's like, here's just, it's just a, you know, it's just sort of, it's not even a tool belt or box. It's not even that organized. It's just like a, it's like a bag of hammers and wrenches that, you know, here, you know, go and do a, a search on uh, whether you can see this news story other places. And if you don't see that news story other places, maybe that's not a real news story. Um, look up some stuff that was, I think, too advanced. Like, look up who owns a domain, right? Which was, was way too advanced now that we look look back at it. Uh, all these, all these, like, you know, 14, 15 sorts of things you could do to test the veracity or credibility of a source or a claim. And that, that um, conce these are the kinds of things that conceivably would have helped the young person who found yeah. themselves on governmentslaves.org. Yeah, exactly. Um, citing resources on water policy, to, you know. Um, yeah, that. exactly. Like you could, you could look up and you could say, hey, you know, is Government Slaves a well-known publication in Wikipedia? You know, like, like, is this is this a well-known, you know, uh, publication? Uh, you could look at some of the stories that they had on that and and throw them into a web search and uh, uh, see if they're associated with Snopes fact checks, right? Things like that. Um, and so, yeah, this this big bag of of sort of, um, I think, useful stuff, but just kind of all over the place. Um, and I, I uh, and then I encountered the work of uh, Sam uh, Weinberg and uh, Sarah McGrew had written a piece where they had looked at students and their ability to sort of make these uh, claim and source credibility um, evaluations. And it, it was, you know, it was, it was like, it was like kind of going back in time and, and, and getting to exactly that place. I, I mean, I could put myself back in that library. Like, I remember actually really specifically the library room I was in as they were showing me these papers. And then I was looking at their work and I was like, this is exactly, this is exactly the same thing. Like, like this, this is this. And so, um, uh, I wrote this and, kind and what, of long... And what, I would, you know, yeah. just for our listeners who aren't familiar, what Mike, oh. and, uh, what Sam and Sarah's research shows um, is that if you ask Stanford freshmen and tenured history professors to do pretty reasonable information literacy tasks, um, they are shockingly bad at those tasks. Um, and if you ask professional fact checkers at news magazines, they are a hundred percent accurate with much less time. Um, you know, that ba like basically we can find a group of people for whom we can give all these web literacy challenges and they always get it right. And they always do it relatively quickly. And they simply use different strategies than the Stanford freshmen and the tenured historians use. Um, is, is that how would you summarize the research that yeah, way? Is that yeah, yeah. Although it's even weirder than that, Justin. I'll tell you, it's even weirder yeah. than that because actually the the one that I was seeing was the one in November 2016, which was the first one, which just showed students, showed nothing but students. And of course, like you said, they're shockingly bad at this stuff. They look at a, a picture of uh, mutated daisies and it says, "Hey, this was found near Fukushima. Is this good evidence?" that uh, you know c conditions are unsafe around this nuclear power plant that's had this uh, that's had this issue and and students just they just kind of react to it and they say yeah it is uh, because you know you can't tr look at those tasers you can't trust nuclear power and other students say no this isn't good anybody can put anything up on the internet so it's not good evidence um, and nobody actually just does the simple thing which is does look up, hey, has anybody talked about this daisy on the web, <laughs> right? Could we just go and see if, if, if other people who actually know more than me have looked at this daisy and, and talked about it? No one does that, no one does that. And, and what I saw at the time was fascinating was everybody was looking at 
Sam and Sarah's article and they were all, they were all going, you know, ain't it awful, ain't it awful. What we really need to have is more critical thinking. And and so my large rant in November was like you know, I just read this study from these two people and I'm looking at the news coverage of it and nobody is actually getting what's going on here. It's not about critical thinking. It's that the students don't actually go and do things. It's about critical doing, right? It's about getting off the page and like just doing these really quick things. And so I went into my whole history with government slaves and uh, it was a long, long rant. Um, but, but basically said, uh, 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 look, everybody is looking at this study wrong. And then um, I think, I mean, the, 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 the story as it's developed, I, I think you are probably the one connection that I actually had to Sam. It may have come through some other way. But Sam, uh, Sam Weinberg ended up re reading it and he said, you know what, we got to talk. And also there's another study that we're doing and I want to tell you about this study. And that's that study that you're talking about. Got it. With the, uh, with the fact checkers. And so, and so it, it ended up being... Um, it ended up being uh, just this lucky piece that they were doing this research and they kind of had a, a theoretical frame that kind of took my bag of hammers and wrenches and screwdrivers and kind of started to slot it into, um, uh, you know, something that 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 was a little more uh, streamlined. A and, schema. Uh, direct a schema. Yeah, a schema, you know. Uh, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, we, could, we could talk a little bit about uh, what that schema looks like but that but that's that's how it started right that's how it started basically um old work that was shelved and then uh when i was seeing this new work i was like this this is this is you know this is groundhog day you know i mean i think a lot of people who encounter the the research that you've done the research that sam done ha, has done with his team have a similar experience of going wow this is really bad um, this is really a problem. Um, and, you know, there's two parts of the problem. One is that we ask all kinds of people to do basic evaluation of, um, of information on the web and they, and they don't perform well in relatively straightforward tasks. And then two, when you dig a little bit deeper, what they, the approach they seem to be taking is wrong but it's exactly what they're being taught to do. Yeah. Um, the 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 strategies that you know you you know you talk about the crap checklist, which we I don't think we uh, we enumerated what that was, but this is a pretty standard um, you know uh, source evaluation that crap stands for currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. Um, why? Why don't those why why don't the standard approaches that we're using work, and why do we keep teaching them? Yeah, so crap, and this was something we actually learned uh, when you know back in that library room when we looked at what the what the librarians were using was this crap model, and what we learned as we looked at it was that what the students were doing um, was actually sort of predicted by what they were taught, right? And uh, so you mentioned what crap is about, right? Currency, uh, relevance, authority, accuracy, purpose. Uh, and it's, it's really a set of questions. And I think if you actually map out what people usually do with crap, it's about 26 questions because each one of those things has um, like five questions under it. Um, but it was never developed actually for people to evaluate web uh, you know, web resources. I mean, at some point it was transferred to that. At some point it became repurposed. Um, but the, the the sorts of questions that are asked there are actually questions that were developed initially back in the 1970s and 1980s as, as collection uh, selection criteria, right? So uh, if you imagine yourself as a librarian and, and you've got to decide, hey, do I spend money on this book or do I spend money on this book? Right. You got to have some sort of selection criteria. It's going to be transparent so that you can explain to this person, hey, this is why I got Carl Sagan's book and this is why I did not get your healing with crystals book. Right. You know, because you're it's public money. Um, and so actually some of the early standards of this came out of uh, like medical libraries that, that were kind of fighting this battle as to where the money went. Uh, and it's a good model for that, because what you look at is so you look at something like currency. Right. Currency just says, you know, hey, is this the most current information available? If you're, you know, if you're a library, you want to make sure you have current books. You want to make sure you kind of have the state 
of the art. Uh, um, you know, is the purpose, does the purpose suit our clientele, right? Uh, does, uh, you know, is the accuracy of the book, um, uh, you know, is the accuracy of the book uh, high? Does it seem to be high? And it's the sort of thing is if you're going to be a librarian uh, spending, you know, a, a few hours going through and trying to decide what set of books to get, it's not a bad set of decision making criteria. Um, but it, it really fails on the web because uh, when you look at the way people use it on a web page, uh, what they tend to do is they tend to come to the page and they tend to see this as a set of items on a checklist. And the more that you kind of can check off, the better the source must be. So if I go and I see a piece of misinformation, but it's absolutely current, it just came out, right? Somehow this is still a check for it. It's like, okay, well, well, it's, it's up to date. That's good. So that's uh, 1.4. Uh, and then, I, you know, I look at it and like, well, there's no spelling errors here. That's a high level of accuracy. That's two points for. And then you have a whole bunch of stuff under this that are just sort of bizarre sort of like internet folklore things like, oh, well, if it's a dot org, it's more likely to, to, to be, it's, it's likely to be better than if it's a dot com. Th that there's never been any truth to that whatsoever. Uh, but, but that's sort of been adopted. And so, so you're like, well, this is a dot com. So that's a strike against. And two things are going to happen. One is none of this stuff really matters, right? None of this stuff really matters. What matters is like, what do people in the know really think about this that you can trust? And then the second thing that, that happens is even if it did matter, if you answer, if you take a sort of, if you're overwhelmed by complexity and then you go through 26 questions and a third of them end up being looks not so good and two thirds of them end up being looks good. You haven't solved your complexity problem. You've taken something that has a relatively complex, overwhelming task and you've just sort of expanded the complexity uh, of it. And now you're going to have to wait to all these things. You're going to be like, well, is the third that is bad? Is that particularly bad? It doesn't it doesn't actually solve any problem you have. <laughs> so that, some of here. No, it's great. So, I mean, some of that background, I didn't know. I, I didn't know that the crap test sort of emerged from, you know, evaluating books to be included in libraries. And it makes sense that a set of criteria to evaluate books to be included in libraries is not the right criteria to use um, to uh, sort truth from fiction online. Um, so we know we know that the things that were are were happening in school are not working. Presumably we keep teaching these things over and over again um, because there's a kind of conservatism and inertia that's inherent in systems. The the crap test, you know, the, the, like the internet emerges, the crap test gets spread around. I mean, I actually have this hypothesis that one of the reasons why these checklist approaches like emerged and spread in the late 1990s and the early 2000s was that they actually did kind of work okay. Um, that misinformation sites were in fact like, you know, sort of had more of these flaggable kinds of errors um, than more credible sites did. And so, like, you know, there was there was maybe a period in which using a crap test might have sort of worked, although that might that might simply be me being too charitable to the checklist. I, 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 think, you, I think you're being too... I, I found a study in like 1990 eight or 99 that looked at this. And uh, and this was even before it was called crap. Uh, there was a previous one that was like, I forget, like cocoa or something. It's the same things, but it was mapped onto different terms. Uh, the, the the term crap comes out of, uh, it's, it's like 2004 when they come up with that particular acronym. And it was showing even in the late nineties that the librarians applying this approach, um, they, they, were, they were simply not finding any correlation uh, with um, uh, student uh, uh, success in these uh, in these things, but uh, but I will say though I will say that the, the the sort of social problem around that has become more intense, right? So so it certainly is the case that our the sort of amount of time that we have to evaluate individual things has shrunk. That we are used to seeing a lot more things fly by us uh, in a day. Uh, than we used to, right? And so, and so, the the necessity of getting something that is uh, more manageable and more quick uh, has certainly gone up. Um, and then, yeah, I would say that some of the things like accuracy, uh, you know, where people look at things like layout and things like that, 
some of those problems um, are more intense now, right? You know, the in, ni- in the 1990s, you kind of didn't have WordPress. You didn't have like blogging software that was just really simple to make a, a decent looking site. Uh, so if you found something that was a decent looking site, you could at least know there was some money behind it. You know, it wasn't some crank in the basement. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, so I guess, I guess I'm saying it's a little bit of a mixed bag. There were, there were warning signs even at the beginning, but it certainly has been the case that something which may have sort of kind of sometimes had a half decent effect has now, uh, really, um, become useless. I mean, so yeah. it's, it's also the case that in educational systems, periodically we adopt programs that have a lot of face validity and don't work and use them for long periods of time before realizing they don't work and use them for long periods of time after there's good science suggesting that, you know, the sort of um, the D.A.R.E. program to to prevent drug yeah. abuse in schools is a good example. There's well, lots of well, other good examples. Well, and John Warner says something interesting about crap uh, that I, I, I learned from. Um, he said that the thing about crap is it's a really bad tool, but... It is a st- it is a half decent statement of values, right? Hmm. So if you think about what you value in a work, and this kind of makes sense if you think about it as initially developed uh, and coming out of library collection criteria, it's a half decent statement about what you value in works that you select, right? Mm-hmm. But it's not a good way to go about uh, determining it, right? And so, so I think the face validity of it partially comes from the fact that people can look at crap and say, well, yeah, these are things that I would value in a work, right? But are they the questions that students should be asking? Sometimes those are, 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 are two separate processes. And I think that's where the difficulty comes from. So in, let's move on to then what those questions are that students should be asking. So you have these 14 or 15 tools, you reorganize them into a schema, you organize them around this idea called SIFT. Um, walk us through, you know, your kind of introduction to how students should be evaluating yeah. sources online. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the idea of SIFT is, um, you know, the broad idea is this idea of lateral reading, uh, you know, that, that uh, again, is, is theorized by uh, mm-hmm. McGrew and Weinberg and uh, Breakstone and others. Um, and that's the idea to, to really learn uh, about the credibility of a claim or a source, you probably want to go and see what the rest of the knowledge network says about it, right? So if you really want to learn if a news story is true that comes to you from some rando, go and see what other people are saying about the news story. Like, don't, like, don't, like, delve deeply into that person's uh, work on it. Just go and see, is this a generally reported story? And the general principle around a source is, you know, the about page is, uh, of a website is a good starting point, but that's what the site itself is saying about itself. And, and you know, you see the problem there. If it's not a trustworthy site, <laughs> then the about page is not necessarily trustworthy either. So go and see. Don't look at what Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says about himself. Look at what other people say about Robert F. Kennedy Jr., you know, in his work in vaccines. Like, get... Yeah, get off the site and see what the the larger community says. SIFT is kind of a middle layer to that that reminds us of of, of three separate, well, four four things. The first is just stop, right? So it's an acronym, SIFT, S-I-F-T. First is just stop. Just if you see if you find yourself emotional, if you find something that you just gotta share. If you see a lot of you, maybe you do see a lot of spelling errors or something on it, something that makes you go, hmm, okay. Whatever, whatever is the trigger, right? The emotion, your excitement about sharing it, your rage, um, seeing something that just strikes you as a little bit odd, whatever is the trigger, stop and ask yourself, um, do I really know what I'm looking at here? Right? And you might, you might. If you, if you have some expertise in something, you might be looking at something, you got pretty good, you're like, yeah, I, 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 uh, I know enough about this subject to know that this is probably true, you know? Um, and you might be looking at it, if you stop and you look, you might look at the source and you might you might be like, oh yeah, I know this person. Most of the time, a lot of the time you don't, right? A lot of time you just, it just landed on your doorstep, you know? A, a subject you've Tum- heard- Tumbled nothing, down your feed. Tumbled down your feet, right? I have, to, I have this, I have this whole uh, little 
parable I tell about this bottle in a lake. And I, I, I say, uh, you know, the web is sort of, you know, the web is sort of like this. You're walking along the beach and you see this bottle in a lake. It's kind of bobbing in the waves and you go and grab the bottle and you pull out this note. And the note says, you know, uh, N95 mask, don't prevent COVID. And so you start and you dig into the note and you look and it has some footnotes and it has, uh, you know, it has some charts and there's some data there and makes a really logical argument about the size of the mask weave and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, when you go to your friend, you say, hey, you know, I, I, um, I found this note in a box. You know, I, I found this, uh, you know, N95 masks don't work. And your friend's like, well, you know, that's very disturbing if true. And uh, how do you know that? I said, well, I found this note in a bottle floating on the lake. <laughs> you know, and 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 the and, and the and person says, well, you know, uh, th that doesn't sound great. And you're like, but no, I looked at the note. I looked really deeply at the note, and I followed all the logical arguments. And the note has lots of footnotes and so forth, right? So the point again is that the web is sort of like that. The web sort of tumbles this stuff at your feet, which may have again, let me if we use this term, face validity, may have some sort of validity on its face, uh, but you want to get away from that. So you're gonna you're gonna stop, and you're gonna say, hey. I pulled this bottle out of the lake. I actually don't know who it's from, and I'm not actually a virologist, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm probably going to have to zoom zoom out here. Um, investigate the source is really simple. It's not a Pulitzer Prize winning investigation. It is as simple as um, I want to find out uh, who is this who is this person that's telling me this. Um, are they in a position to know, right? Is there a reason they would know more about this subject than the average person, either through their profession, maybe they're a reporter, uh, or as, a, as an expert? Um, and, and do they have uh, some reputational incentives uh, to try to be as, as truthful and as, as uh, uh, non-spinny uh, as possible, right? You know, um, so what, what's, their, what's their, we don't talk so much about bias, but we do talk about agenda. Like, what's their agenda? Right? Is there agenda to get you to buy nutritional supplements, or is there agenda uh, to inform? Right, and those are two sort of separate agendas. So look at that. Or is there agenda? Maybe they're a comedian and they're they're into satire. That would inform you as well. Um, and then uh, find other coverage. Find better coverage. Uh, is uh, if uh, that source in itself is not sufficient to say, oh, okay, this is a really solid source. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sort of, I'm gonna just take this uh, at face value. Um, then go and find something better. You don't have to be, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to come with the, uh, it's not the dance, right? You don't have to, you know, dance with the person that brought you. You know, you can actually go and you can find a, um, uh, you can find a, a better source. And then some things are a little more complex and, um, it turns out you can't find better coverage on something. Uh, it turns out the source that initially um, provided you the claim is not uh, reliable. And so the trace, the T, the trace, um, is about, okay, well, so this person makes this claim. Let's, let's follow the links that they provide and uh, see if, if it gets us to a better or more reliable source. That's, a, that's kind of a last step because you want to be careful that you're not sort of sucked into their game of pulling you into their sort of uh, knowledge network, um, you know, and, and, and uh, it's always better to sort of zoom out, pick your own expert, you know, pick, you know, pick the best expert, pick the best source, pick better coverage than to follow their web in. But sometimes you got to do that. You know, I mean, it strikes me there that that highlights an important distinction with the older kind of crap checklist models, which is, you know, the idea of crap, which I'm sure virtually no one has ever done outside of an assessment criteria, is that like you're supposed to use all of these criteria to evaluate a website. Um, and with the SIFT model, you're really supposed to stop and quit as soon as you get kind of triggered um, that something's not right here, you know, that it might or, be. Or that there's something is right. Or there's something is right. That's one of the weirdest things is we give students permission to stop when it looks like it's good enough. Mm -hmm. And students get a little freaked out. <laughs> I mean, they do. They do. This is one of the most bizarre things about teaching students is, uh, you know, you'll find something as a viral image of a gigantic tortoise or something. Uh, and it turns out to be true. Um, or like, you know, 
little windows that have been put into cows. I saw you like that tweet earlier. Uh, little windows that, been, you know, it turns out to be, it turns out that it turns out to look like it's true. And you ask the student, and you say, hey, so what do, you, what do we think about this? And the student's like, well, you know, it's reported in a couple things that look pretty reputable, you know? And you're like, oh, yeah, so what do you, what do you think? And they're like, uh, uh, good enough. And, the, and then there's just a kind of freeze, like they've never said good enough before. Uh, you know, and they're like, but now we're going to have to delve in deeper. It's like, no, you're, you're sharing like a viral cow image, right? Like if, if, if three major <laughs> reporting sources have verified the viral cow image, you know, I don't think it's your job as a consumer of information to somehow outdo like, I don't know, the Irish Times or something uh, there, right? So, so there is, there's a stopping rule. There's a stopping rule when you come to something and it's fishy enough, you just say, hey, I'm gonna pass. When you come to something and you're like, I am, I am of the opinion that enough people I trust did enough work on this that, that, uh, that, that, that it's good enough, you stop there too. Um, how would you contrast this with critical thinking? How how yeah. is this sort of not critical thinking? Because I because I get the sense of the argument that you make that Sam make that like this is something that's different from critical thinking. It's from critical. I got to say this really clearly. Uh, Alex Jones uh, came after me uh, really hard on this, as did a bunch of other people that that I was somehow anti-critical thinking. You can find the video of him going Michael Caulfield. <laughs> Congratulations, an academic. Man. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he, uh, you know, people, oh, Michael, Michael Caulfield's against critical thinking. And I'm not. I'm against critical thinking as taught. And the, 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 the problem with critical thinking as taught is it's largely taught as an individual epistemology, right? The idea is that you, you know, with your own super smart brain, are going to somehow directly verify these arguments through the logical train of the arguments, through the data that you find in the document, uh, through looking for any inconsistencies that might surface, right? Uh, through uh, getting some sense of whether it's well sourced or not well sourced, right? That you are going to do that. Your your critical thinking uh, powers. It's a very uh, generally taught as very individualistic epistemology, and and it removes the most important thing in most decisions we make, which is social epistemology. That is, we need to know how to read and read relatively quickly, um, you know, the, the state of knowledge or opinion of expert and professional communi uh, communities on uh, things that we're interested in, you know? And that's, that's, that simply hasn't really been made a, a piece of, of um, critical thinking, which is, again, so much about sort of direct verification. Uh, and one of the things I, I talk about, uh, you know, is that we spend, for example, so much time putting students into, uh, uh, you know, science labs uh, where they replicate these various experiments. And that's not bad to learn the techniques of science, uh, but, you know, students grow up, you know, graduate high school and anybody, you know, most of them can tell you, hey, you know, mitochondria, you know, uh, powerhouse of the cell. The powerhouse of the cell, if you will. <laughs> powerhouse of the cell. I don't know how much it goes beyond that. Uh, but, you know, if you ask a question like, you know, what's the difference in the mission between the CDC and the NIH? which is actually going to be much more useful to you in the course of your life. Understanding that the CDC is a community engaged uh, uh, um, agency, which actually uh, spends a lot of its time hashing out uh, its decisions and suggestions with stakeholders in the NIH as a research agency. And these serve, you know, synergistic, but different functions. That's going to be a lot more useful to you for understanding what the CDC means when it says this you know, and who they may have talked to and what, you know, that sort of stuff, which is pretty easily teachable, not anywhere in any curriculum, but that's, that's the sort of social epistemology stuff. That's, that's saying, what are the, what are the, we've built these sort of vast infrastructures of knowledge creation and, 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 in knowledge testing, right? Uh, knowledge verification, these vast infrastructures, and then we teach students, though, the way you verify things is you get a test tube and you drop some stuff in it. <laughs> no, and that's not the way you verify things. The way you verify things in a complex, you know, uh, uh, multi-professional uh, society that has high degrees of specializations uh, is, is you learn 
what the knowledge infrastructure is in an area, how it works, what consensus looks like in a community, what dissensus looks like in a community, what an emerging majority opinion looks like in a community. And if you can get a read on that relatively quickly, if you understand, for example, that by the time the American Physical Society says climate change is real and we're writing up the memo for the entire association, that you have an academic society that just, you know, wrote a memo for its its that an academic society coming to that point the, that that means that the 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 actual intellectual question was uh kind of resolved a while back right that that the APS saying that about climate change is bigger than any individual paper is ever going to be you know a, a entire society of, of physicists saying this is a statement of our profession understanding that the fundamental difference between a statement that can be read as a consensus of a profession and, oh, someone forwarded me this paper that says actually there was something called the Little Ice Age and we had grapes uh, in a place that we didn't expect, that these are, these, are, these are fundamentally different things, not something that anybody understands coming out of high school and probably the most important thing a person can learn. Well, let me then... I'm backing um, up from the mic. <laughs> back up from the mic, Mike Caulfield. Um, because this is something which has interested me about these lateral reading SIFT approaches is that the SIFT approach is very simple. The, you know, the, the kind of the first few steps that you take are relatively straightforward. L learning the basics of information and scientific consensus production is harder Learning the details, like you brought up, of what's the difference of the CDC versus the NIH. Obviously, like that one pair of facts is not that hard to figure out. But multiply that by every government agency that exists, and and you now have you know a, a wide variety, you know, a pretty extensive background knowledge that people need to go beyond the SIF. That's that's sort of my interpretation yeah. of like if you want people to be good at information literacy, the first thing that you do is you teach them some basic steps, most of which is instead of trying to figure out whether the bottle in the note is accurate by like looking really closely at the bottle, it is just ask what other people think about the message that's in the note. Um, yeah. That's like a relatively straightforward first step. But then everything that you need to know to be able to you know, evaluate every possible claim is, is, a, is you know, a lifetime's pursuit of knowledge. It is, but, but it is such, here, here's what we have found. And, and I would love to, I'd love to get more sort of rigorous research, uh, you know, verifying this. But I, I can tell you that we have found over and over again that it is a virtuous cycle. That mm. SIFT is the first, is the first step. I'll, I'll give you an example. We we did um, um, there's actually a, there's actually a pretty rigorous assessment of of, of this uh, intervention we did at, at uh, Cooney Staten Island, uh, and, uh, and and the results we got from this intervention in terms of students being able to uh, assess uh, the the you know credibility of various sources of claim really great results right really great results. But stu students haven't learned the SIFT. You bring it in, you bring in some curriculum, you give them some teaching and training. Afterwards, they do much, much better. They make far- They do much, much better. Right, right, right. So they, they're, you know, if you look at students that are coming to correct, correct conclusions and using lateral reading, like you're seeing like these tenfold increases, right? In, in, in an intervention that's like three weeks. You know, so you're pretty excited, right? You're pretty excited because it's, it's not, and, and I just, your, your listeners will know this, but this is not content, right? This is skills. So, yep. so when you're seeing 46% of students uh, at, on at least one prompt, you know, coming to a level of mastery in three weeks, right? That's not 46% of students getting 90% on a vocab list. That's 46% of students applying a set of skills. And so, so that's, from coming from something like three percent, right? So, so that's that's a gigantic increase that that like is shocking to me. I I, I talk to people a lot of what I do talks to people that are just in the misinformation world, and sometimes I feel like they do not understand what a weird, what a profoundly weird educational result that is. Like, because I have done so many assessments and so many other things, I have never seen anything skills based that works anything like that. but anyway I'll, I'll back off that that I'm, I'm ramping that up but here's 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 the more important thing about that Cooney Staten Island um, intervention uh, we did it in 
September, uh, early October uh, of the year. And then in May, we get this letter from the director of scholarships, the scholarship office uh, in Cooney, Staten Island. And they don't know anything about what we did. They didn't know we did this intervention in all the freshman classes or whatever. But they write this letter and they say, hey, you know, I, I, uh, so I, I direct this uh, the scholarship office and uh, there's a scholarship that that is this big deal scholarship at Cooney Staten Island. And um, a lot of students apply to it and it has a social engagement piece to it. And so because the students that are going to apply to it have to go to this interview process with the funder, uh, with the granting organization, we have them in and we do the, we do the, we do like little run throughs with the interview, little run through interviews. And every year she says, um, we ask the students, you know, where, where do you get your news? And the students basically say, yeah, on the web. And we'll have one student, you know, out of a dozen who says, oh, well, the New York Times. And that's it. She says, she says, this year, every single student gave us multiple sources they consult for, for, uh, for news. Students were talking about how they might prefer a local source for local news, that for international news, they might go to Reuters, <laughs> you know, uh, that, uh, uh, and that uh, for something, you know, for something that might be, uh, you know, more, uh, more scientific or whatever, you know, they go to some other, uh, you know, science. And, and they were rattling off all these sources. And here's the thing is, is we, didn't ne we didn't necessarily teach them those sources. Right. But they're getting on the web in this process of saying, oh, I'm just going to do a news search. What do they start to do? They start some things keep popping up like nat whenever they're looking at something that's about uh, landscape, about uh, wildlife, maybe National Geographic pops up and they suddenly think, oh, well, National Geographic. It, and I've done the Wikipedia search that actually. So there's a virtuous cycle that, that starts here. Now, there's some stuff you've got to prime, right? So, for example, students don't understand the difference between like an advocacy group and a research group or all the, the things in between. So that's a concept you've got to prime because, it, because if they don't understand, hey, look, you know, advocacy is really sort of a mission first organization. A research group may have a mission, uh, but but it has certain principles that try to keep put some guardrails on uh, on that. There's certain things you got to prime. You know, what's the difference between a uh, you know what's the difference between an opinion column, you know, in the newspaper, and what's the difference between an art? You know, some stuff you got to prime, uh, but a lot of this is just a virtuous cycle, and 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 so. We do see this where students, even in the course of the classroom session, it, put, you, it puts them on a better path. The path that yeah. we have students on right now is is not working, is not giving them the skills that they need to be successful in information literacy. And even when, when they have a certain kind of skepticism, it leads them to this really desperate kind of, you can't trust anything on the web kind of skepticism, which is in some respects equally poisonous to, well, everything is true. If yep. you start pointing them in the right direction of lateral reading, then you get them interested and excited about how you can do verification, how knowledge is formed in the society, and they start developing more and more interest in, uh, in all those various spokes. In every question that comes up, because of the way this is structured, every question that comes up ends up being like a little, you know, foray out into our knowledge infrastructure, right? So, so because they're not just focusing on this note that came to them in the bottle, which will have no benefit, no benefit from them outside that note, if that's what they focus on, right? Because what they're doing is sort of venturing out and saying, hey, you know, what are the sources out there? Hey, um, what is the APS? Is, it, you know, is, that a is that a big organization for physicists? You know, because they're venturing out there and they're learning these things, every individual question that comes to them, even if it's about whether scientists put windows in cows, right? Even the most trivial question um, ends up building their knowledge of what's out there to answer questions. What are the better sources to answer questions? What's a good source for this? What's, what, what are some of the proficiencies? And so uh, over time, and this is one of the things that I'm really interested in exploring, um, I, I think you can give students ridiculous prompts, 
I'm, I'm in this whole animal, animal behavior thing right now where I've got like 57 prompts that are just on, you know, unusually large dogs, you know, <laughs> um, you know, or, or like, uh, you know, a, a, a tiger getting loose uh, in Houston. And, and, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about that is because even the trivial prompts push you out into the real, you know, social knowledge infrastructure, you start to build over time. You start to build this. Thing. And that's the really interesting thing about the Cooney Staten Island thing to me is that I because I've seen these kids in class, not not the particular ones at Staten Island, but all the ones that I've taught, um, I know those students were proud to be rattling off all these things. They were listing these things off like a hipster lists off indie bands. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like they were showing, they were showing, they had a pride that they actually understood the information landscape. They, they were basically saying, look, I can draw you, you, you want me to draw you a map? I'll draw you a map. Look, National Geographic is over here. And you know, over here you have uh, Reuters and uh, you know, and you've got some of these uh, sources in India, which uh, can be dodgy at times, but you know, can, can yeah. So you start to get, you start to get this, this map. And so even trivial questions, start to build this this deeper understanding of this knowledge infrastructure. And that's a piece of it that's really exciting to me. Well, Mike, it's a story about an incredibly difficult problem, but with some really uh, hopeful solutions. And uh, that's a, that, that um, sense of self-efficacy that students are developing is a great place to sign off. So thanks so much for joining us on Teach Lab. Oh, my pleasure. I'm Justin Reich. Thanks for listening to Teach Lab. You can check out our show notes for links to all kinds of parts of Mike's work, from web literacy to for student fact checkers uh, to sifting through the pandemic and other resources that we discussed today. Be sure to subscribe to Teach Lab for future episodes and consider leaving us a review. You can find my new book, Failure Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education at booksellers everywhere. And you can check out related content at failuretodisrupt.com. That's failuretodisrupt.com. Me and my colleagues at the Teaching Systems Lab have two courses you can sign up for on edX. If you enjoy the topic of today's episode, you can join me and Sam Weinberg from Stanford University in Sorting Truth from Fiction, Civic Online Reasoning, where you'll learn the skills and practices of information literacy, lateral reading, the SIF technique that folks like fact checkers use to sort fact from fiction online. And you'll learn great ways to teach these strategies to your students. And you can join myself and Vanderbilt professor Rich Milner in a free self-paced online course for educators called Becoming a More Equitable Educator, Mindsets and Practices. Through inquiry and practice, you'll cultivate a better understanding of yourself and your students. You'll find new resources to help all students thrive and develop an action plan to work in your community to advance the lifelong work of equitable teaching. Even if you've taken these courses in the past, we'd love to have you back. Bring your colleagues, form a learning circle in your school or community, and come and participate in our online community. You can find the links to these courses on edX in our show notes, and you can enroll now. This episode of Teach Lab was produced by Amy Corrigan and Garrett Beasley, recorded and sound mixed by Garrett Beasley. Stay safe until next time. <laughs>